this is what happens to the cells in your brain. This is what happens after that injury occurs. And this is why it's important that you follow these protocols. And this is why you feel the way you feel. You're listening to the Restoring Human Movement podcast, where movement experts discuss the latest evidence-based practices to help you and your clients move with mastery. And now, your host, Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez with the Restoring Human Movement podcast. Thanks for joining the Movement Movement. I am going to have an interview today with somebody, and you heard a little snippet of that. That was Dr. Cameron Marshall out of Toronto. He is the owner and creator of Complete Concussion, and he was actually recommended to be on the show by one of the listeners. Thanks for recommending. By the way, if you guys have someone you want to listen to, you just you just hit me up. Actually, Instagram probably the, is probably the quickest way. That's at performancehb, or just email me. That's uh, seb at p2sportscare.com. Anyways, this is going to be a great interview. Um, actually, one surprising thing that I thought with... Uh, Dr. Marshall was when I was listening to his other podcasts with other people, he was amazing at storytelling and just presenting very complex ideas, especially surrounding concussion and neurology and making it very simple. So I think it's a really big part of working with people. As you can tell, we go through that in the podcast today. Um, A couple things too, just to make sure that you're on the right place is that if you're a clinician who likes to manage concussions or is looking to start managing concussions, this is a really amazing place to start. I personally don't manage concussions, so um, it was a lot of new stuff for me. I did go through and learn some stuff as of about three years ago uh, on concussions, but I haven't really updated stuff, so there's a lot of new things, a lot of new things. A lot of new things changed since three years ago. Also, too, if you're a patient who's been suffering from a concussion or know someone who has had a concussion... This is something that's going to interest you as well. We do get a little bit techy in there, but for the most part, there are some very simple points. There's a lot of simple points, and it's good conversation. We talk about jackalopes and pickle lake and all that kind of good stuff, so you'll dig it there. So before we get in the interview, let me just remind you guys that we're gonna you're going to learn a little bit more about me and my nuances today through a tiny, tiny story, and then we're going to get right into the interview. Here we go. Now, one thing that really grinds my gears about Costco, and I love Costco. Costco, you're, you're my boy. I, I love all of the meat. I love all of the crabs. I love the toilet paper, churros, everything about it, except for one thing. And that thing is when you get up to that front door, they want you to take your card out and show your, mem- your membership card. And by the way, I know they have the membership card and then they have a credit card. Did you know you can interchange them? You can actually take your credit card and that, that works for membership status. I had no idea. For a very long time, I was carrying two cards. I'm a minimalist. I don't like that. So anyways, getting into the door there, there's there's always someone that asks you to, they stop you, hey man, can I see your card? And I'm like, oh, come on man, like you know, going through here and getting all my stuff, I can't buy anything, I can't get through the register unless I have a card anyways. So, I mean, you gotta be kind of silly to get into Costco and, and not actually uh, understand this. So, I tend to not show it, and I wait until they actually really bother me, and there's actually one guy at ours where he doesn't ask and I love it. And I recognize him. He recognizes me, I think. Maybe he just doesn't ask me, but we. But I love going when he's there because I don't like getting in. It reminds me of air, airport security. It's like you go through, you got to unpackage all your shit, you got to show them your stuff, you got to put it back th- in, and then there's that clog right at the front of the Costco uh, member or the, the entrance right there. So maybe if someone works at Costco or worked at Costco, can you enlighten me on this? Because it drives me a little nuts. I know you can get pharmacy products, I think, without a card. I think you can get alcohol and then something else. I think there was a, there was a couple exclusions, which I thought was kind of odd. I, I don't really understand about that either. But I think we can improve Costco if we do like a turnstile gate, maybe. That that card, since you can't get you can't get through without having it anyways, leave it in your pocket. Maybe it dings you in. It just knows you that you're there, and it opens this door. And that way you don't have to do, you don't have to pay the greeters anymore. You just have this automatic turnstile gate. Maybe those greeters can do other jobs in Costco, but we're, we're, we're going to be more efficient. So anyways, let's improve Costco on this. So it's just one thing that drives me a little nuts every time I go. I go weekly and I, I keep thinking, I hope it's that guy there. I don't want to show my card. If someone else is with me, they can show their card. I don't want to show my card. I'm off the grid, man. All right, now into the content. All right, everyone. Uh, welcome on, Dr. Cameron Marshall. Hey, say hey. What's going on? Hey, what's going on, everybody? Good. You're, you're right on point. You just exactly what I wanted you to say right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
I wanted to have you on actually with so you were you were actually suggested you were suggested to be the to be an uh, entertainer on the show. You still are you, good. I see your internet blinking out a little bit. So it was it was Mike Murdoch. Yeah, yeah. hopefully it's uh, it's gonna hold up there. Mike Mike Murdoch, okay. you, you guys did a I think you did a webinar for uh, I is it a Cairo one at Western States I think. Yeah, it was Western States Cairo College, I believe. Uh, it was the rehab to performance uh, club that they have there, mm-hmm. and so I did a I did a webinar for all the students. Oh, nice! Did they mm-hmm. uh, had they actually find you to do it? I don't even know. I, I I think I I think he got recommended to me in some some way, and then sent me an email, or maybe reached out to me on Instagram. Um, I'm not quite sure, but uh, he asked, and I said, "Yeah, sure, that'd be great." Oh, cool. Um, well, I thought I'd, I I try to frame things to make sure that uh, we both know who the audience is. Um, when we go through stuff, I might ask you a couple secondary follow up questions just to clarify. And I'm assuming that the listeners of this one are going to be more of like advanced based patients, not just like standard patient, uh, but also to uh, younger clinicians or people like me who actually don't manage concussions. Mm. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay, I'll try to keep it. Try to keep it. Um, not too medical sounding, I guess. Well, I think you did a good job on. Uh, was it George Tate? He interviewed you on the uh, the PT. Yeah. You guys did it. He did a good job interviewing you, I think. So whatever you did on that, we're gonna do that again, but better. Okay, we're gonna recreate <laughs> it. So. Yeah. Um. So what's the deal? Like, why do you why do you like concussions? Like, why do you like messing with concussions, anyways? I don't even. I think it's 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 one of those things. I think it's really the unknown. It's um, there's so much that we don't know and there's so much untapped stuff. But, and, and now we're starting to learn more and more and we're kind of on the forefront of this kind of wave that I think we're starting to realize more and more that concussions are actually treatable, which they've never been in the past. Um, and it kind of just fell in my lap, to be honest. I was, um, I'm, I'm a chiropractor. I, I did my sports um, chiropractic fellowship at, at uh, CMCC here in Toronto and kind of as I was going through that program, we're supposed to pick a topic in research. And it was right around the time of Sidney Crosby's injury. And for, for those hockey fans out there, I mean, he's one of the best players in the NHL and uh, was at the time and still is. And his concussion, he was out. He ended up being out for, for about a year or so. And then I kind of caught wind that he was seeing a chiropractor for some treatment. And then I thought, like, what, what the hell's going on here? You know, how is a chiropractor helping with concussion. I mean, concussion is a brain injury. And so started kind of digging into that and learning all about the pathophysiology and things that happen within the brain and, you know, why uh, really got interested in why some people were taking so long to recover and others were recovering, you know, fairly quickly and getting back into the game within a week or so. And so once I started digging into that, I realized that like, there's actually some evidence coming out looking at, you know, vision rehab and vestibular rehab and treatment of the neck that can resolve a lot of the symptoms that people have following concussion. And so there's a huge overlap between, you know, what we do as, as therapists um, and what the symptoms of concussion actually are and how we can help these patients. And so um, I just got really, really into it, um, obviously. (laughs) And um, uh, that, that became my entire research focus and I just haven't looked back really. It just, and it just keeps, it keeps being interesting for me, which I think is why we kind of keep, keep going on this road. It just, it's, there's always new things coming out. And once you kind of get into it and you learn about the research, it just, you end up with more questions. Mm-hmm. And and then you just kind of go down that rabbit hole of, of questions and and learn more about it and so yeah I don't know I just kind of fell into it but I think the the vastness and the you know kind of the cutting edge of, of where we're at is just super super interesting to me. So what was the other injury or the other condition that you thought that you had to put off to the side because it was it was your second choice? <laughs> <laughs> I mean. I mean, I was doing sports medicine, so it's, you know, any type of sporting injury, it was, was, was interesting, um, to me and concussion was obviously the most interesting once it, once I kind of started digging more into it. Um, I mean, I, I assume like everyone else, I mean, back, you know, you know, five, six years ago, everyone just assumed, well, concussion is concussion. You just got to do, you just got to wait it out and do nothing for it. And so, um, it was the realization that we actually could do something for it that interested, interested me in it. But before that, my research topic, uh, was (laughs) actually, I can't wait. Yeah. it, (laughs) It was actually going to be looking at, um, balance training for hockey players to improve, um, skating, 
uh, speed and kind of efficiency. So there was there was this study that came out looking at kind of correlates of, of skating speed, and they found that the best correlates of, of skating speed in amateur hockey players was um, was their balance measure, kind of single leg standing balance, and also their their forty yard time, which obviously makes sense, right? The faster you can sprint, probably the faster you can skate, and the, the better you can balance on your blades, probably the more power you can generate. And so, um, my idea was actually to do um, kind of an interventional study where we would we would do a balance training program uh, and see, you know, pre versus post balance training program, um, what you know what that did to their skating speed because mm-hmm. uh, I think it's something that's not really trained a lot. I mean, people people will look at power, people will look at you know uh, explosiveness, people will look at you know trying to improve speed, you know, in running and that, but I don't think many people are looking at something like balance. And so I just found that kind of interesting as well. But nonetheless, I. <laughs> <laughs> threw that threw that to the wayside and uh and actually i did my thesis with um john letty at the university of buffalo um who for those that are in the concussion space is a it's a pretty big name uh in the field so i was fortunate enough to be able to learn from him mm-hmm. i'm gonna talk long enough to get, for you to get that coffee down um you know there's still a potential that you can take to finally figure out if there's a correlation between balance and concussions because if you can skate faster and you balance better, can't you get away from the the impact or acceleration injury a little bit better? Yeah, I mean, possibly. I mean, there's all sorts of, <laughs> and that's that again. More questions, right? More questions come out. But there's, um, I mean, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tie that question back into kind of some of the ideas behind why concussions are more prevalent in in female players than male players for a sport like hockey oh i didn't know which that. is very 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 interesting and this is actually yeah like at, at, at the canadian kind of university level um they find that, that women hockey players are actually more likely to get concussions than male hockey players but yet women's hockey is a non-contact sport and male obviously is is a contact sport so some of the theories behind that there's there's kind of three main ones and then one that i think Um, you know, should be looked at a little bit more closely, but this kind of ties into your idea behind, you know, balance and, and, and skating speed and agility, I guess you can say, but the first kind of theory behind why women might get more concussions than men is related to um, neck strength or um, kind of a head to neck ratio. And so that um, there's, there's evidence showing that, you know, the stiffer you can keep your neck, mm-hmm. the less le- the less accelerative force would be transmitted to the head if you were to receive an impact because you can kind of couple your head mass with your body mass and maintain one unit, which increases the moment arm and hmm. decreases the acceleration of, of the brain during impact. And so uh, women just generally having um, uh, thinner uh, necks and m- – not as strong potentially as males, uh, any type of impact might, you know, create more acceleration to their head, making them more susceptible. That's interesting. Uh, it's it's kind of like the, a, the McGill co-contraction model, but for the abdominal area, the wider base of support. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's biomechanics, right? Um, and the kind of a secondary theory is based on, um, um, hormone levels and fluctuations in menstrual cycles and potentially increasing susceptibility during, you know, various times of the cycle. Um, the other one is um, potentially just the the honesty bias, I'll call it, where where women may just may be more likely to report their injury or tell somebody uh, when they're not feeling quite right, whereas men may be more likely to kind of keep quiet and try to you know you know quote unquote tough it out, mm-hmm. um, and that's and that's a theory. And my my kind of theory comes down to um, kind of a game awareness theory, and the reason behind that is because when you look at just neck strength overall neck strength doesn't really protect you against concussions. And this has been disproven in a number of studies where people with, you know, strong necks from an isometric contraction standpoint in various different angles of, of pull and everything else don't have any less high magnitude impacts throughout the season than people with weaker necks, meaning that their head is likely to accelerate just as much. And, the idea behind that is if you look at the amount of time it takes you to contract your neck, uh, it takes about 150 milliseconds to even initiate contraction of the neck muscles kind of voluntarily. It takes another you know, 90 milliseconds or so to even get to half of the contractile strength mm-hmm. of those muscles. 
So then if you think, okay, well, then it maybe it takes another 90 milliseconds. So now you're up to close to 300 milliseconds um, or slightly more to even get, you know, close to contracting and getting the full use of the, st- the, the muscle tension in your neck to create any type of stability in there. Mm-hmm. The amount of time it takes for concussion to happen is, is very, very short. So they found that the, the peak kind of impulse magnitude or peak velocity of, of the head following impact happens in the first six to 20 milliseconds after impact. Mm-hmm. So if it takes you 300 milliseconds to contract your neck muscles, it really matters not necessarily about um, how strong your neck is, but how fast you can contract it and how much time you had beforehand to know that the hit was coming. Mm -hmm. Just them being able to see the hit or see the impact? Exactly. If you know you're going to get hit, you're going to contract, you're going to stiffen up, and you're potentially going to be able to take that hit a lot better where you're going to have less acceleration of the head. Now, if we relate this now, if we compare male and female hockey, if if you're playing men's hockey and it's a full contact sport, um, you're going to you know potentially be more aware of what's going on in your surroundings uh, in terms of hits that may be coming. If I'm going to go into the corner, I'm going to get you know I'm going to tighten up. I'm going to get ready for the hit that may be coming at me, right? Whereas in women's hockey, if I'm not expecting to get hit, I might not do this do that same thing and so when i do get hit it it then creates more head acceleration so it's kind of this game awareness theory now relaying that long story back to (laughs) i'm still with you i'm still with you (laughs) back to kind of balance and agility well again that comes down to game awareness now if you have 300 milliseconds to know that a hit is coming why don't you just step out of the way Mm-hmm. Right. So, so again, I think that balance and agility by themselves are not enough. I think you also have to pair it with the game awareness um, to be able to, you know, shift and move and potentially dodge, dodge those impacts. So mm-hmm. that's Just, kind of my long drawn out. <laughs> I, I still think you combine the two passions. There's still a chance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was, that was my well, point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, we test, we test, a, we test a lot of balance. Uh, we actually use force plates as part of our, um, baseline testing and return to play protocols we put every all our athletes on force plates and look at postural sway and things like that so Mm -hmm. it's definitely still a part of uh and i actually use the same protocol that we were going to use for our hockey balance stuff so good i was i was i was thinking that you probably would the uh because i know there was a couple things that i've done in the past of just making random crap out of wood I thought well, this would be good, and it doesn't end up going anywhere. And then I'm using that same thought process with something else that actually sticks. So, marrying the ideas. It's um, just one big, one big learning circle, my friend. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I was I was thinking too when you're talking about the uh, the reaction, voluntary reaction time. Remember that game that we used to do uh, in school, where like you drop the ruler and you'd measure how long it took you to grab it. So then, can you? Re- I know that's voluntary, but can you train the other receptors to maybe? catch hold quicker is there a latency on some of those people or do we not know uh i i mean that's a i think that's a it's a pretty big question the um we actually use that test as part of our our baseline and post-injury testing um so some of the cues that we try to avoid people from being able to see um is like for example sometimes kids will you know put their hand out and they'll watch they'll watch your hand as the examiner dropping you know said ruler um but that test has actually been been studied at at the university of michigan uh a guy by the name of jeff kutcher and um paul eckner i think his name is and um they kind of took that test a little bit further and they put a basically a hockey puck on the end of a, a wooden dowel mm-hmm. and put and put a measuring tape on it and um, and they would drop it. So you make a C shape with your hand and the puck kind of sits at the at the top of your hand and then you put the person's hand on the table so they can't move it up and down and then you drop it and they catch it and you measure it in in centimeters and it actually converts through a formula into the reaction time in, in seconds. And, um, they've actually, they've actually (laughs) validated this test, believe it or not, listen to this. They validated that test with what they called a functional head protective response. Really? And what it it was is they basically put like a a helmet on people and they fired tennis balls at them out of a tennis ball machine. 
Like and American they, Gladiators? C- kind of, yeah. And they would look at <laughs> – and they would film them in high-speed cameras and look at how, how quickly they were able to initiate reaction to protect themselves. And they called it a functional head protective response, and they actually correlated that drop stick reaction time, showing that it actually is measuring reaction time, and it's actually correlated with your ability to protect yourself. Hmm. And so – that's why we use it as one of our return to play tests. And so you're not only looking at is the reaction time back, but you know, how, how likely are they to be able to protect themselves in the event that something's coming at them. So it's interesting. That, that is interesting. I could take that another route, but we'd probably talk the entire time about this one thing. <laughs> um, I was just curious cause you're, you're, you speak, uh, you speak well, you're a really good speaker. Um, and yeah, that's, it's, it's a hard thing to do. Um, but also too, you can get techie in there. How do you communicate this to a patient? Like, how do you communicate like, Hey, you've had a concussion or whatever. Do you even explain these nuances or is it just like, they're just going to hit that fog real quick? Um, I, I believe a, a lot in patient education and that's actually one of the, the best ways to be able to improve outcomes following concussion is being able to educate and reassure your patients. And so I think being able to take a complex topic and, um, you know, break it down into a simple format for patients is, is one of the most important skills as, you know, a therapist or healthcare provider. And we've done this with concussion and I have kind of a set way that I do it with my patients. We have, um, it's a drawing. I actually, I'll go get a piece of paper and I'll actually draw out. This is what happens to the cells in your brain. This is what happens after that injury occurs. And, this is why it's important that you follow these protocols and this is why you feel the way you feel. And then I break it down from there and I, I try to help the patient understand like, you know, just when you start feeling better, it's not good to, you know, go back and play. And this is why. And I do the same thing for people with chronic injuries where I say, this is what happened initially. These are all the things that happen kind of at the same time and they all overlap in the same symptoms. And so if we can figure out which one of these things is causing your symptoms, we'll be able to help you. And, we're just going to start at the top of the list and we're going to rule this one out and rule this one out and rule this one out. And I find that the clinicians who are the best at this are the ones who are best able to convey that complex message. Um, so I think that's an, that's an important piece, but I've always been decent at doing that. Like I've always been, I've always been the one to take a concept that uh, was complicated and figure out a way to explain it to myself um, mm-hmm. in, in kind of layman's terms so that I could, teach it back to people. So we have, you know, in the university you have study group type things. And I always wanted to be able to like take in and go, okay, now step by step, I'm going to try and explain this. And then, then I feel I understand it. Right. So did people go to you then, uh, like when you were in finishing school or in school, did everyone go to you at the last minute and say, Hey, what do I got to know for this test? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, it, sometimes it was the reverse when I was like, you know, what, what do I got to know for this? Uh, but but yeah, I know I've always like in, in, in more so in university, I think in, in high school, I was able to do that. I think when you get into, you know, graduate school, uh, everyone's, everyone's pretty good at, uh, at figuring out concepts. So you don't, you're not teaching as much, but we, we had, we had a lot of people who were really good at, at playing ping pong throughout the week. I was one of them. And at the last minute we'd all show up into the same, same, same room and say, Hey, what do we got to do? What do we got to know? <laughs> and then all the acronyms come out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You actually had a good analogy with the, uh, it was the jello one. And, and I started thinking about it that is, it, is a concussion kind of like a neuropraxia, like a stinger, but inside the, was it inside the, it was inside the brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you could kind of think of it that way. Um, I think a neuropraxia is probably a little bit more severe actually than, than what a concussion would be. But kind of a similar concept where you get a stretching kind of and 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 shearing of of brain tissue similar to what you'd get with a with a uh, with a burner or a stinger mm-hmm. um, but i don't i don't think it's at the same severity level because you can get degrees of burners and stingers where you're actually creating kind of damage into the microstructural components of that and you're and you're getting kind of remodeling i guess you could get that in in some concussion cases mm-hmm. um which may be a little bit more more severe, but I think the concept is is very similar. Where you're you're getting a, a stretching of brain tissue, but just to the point of just almost just creating stimulation, like overstimulation of of that of that tissue. Mm-hmm. So then, <clears throat> with the, with the severity of things, have you have you ever found anyone that you thought this is a concussion case that it can't that it really can't get better? I've. 
I, I mean, I don't want, like, I've, I found patients that of course are in my office and I'm like, I don't think this person's going to get better. And, and I don't, I never tell them that I always want to give them, you know, the idea that they can get better because I think a lot of the patients that are in that category that I talked about where I say, I just don't think this person's going to get better. And actually, you know, I, I see those people quite frequently. Most of the times I feel it's because the, just the, the deconditioning of the patient is such that, I mean, so the treatment now for, for concussion is, is active rehabilitation. And if someone's not going to be compliant with that rehab and they're not going to put in the work, um, you know, that's going to be an uphill battle for them. But I don't think that's related to concussion. In my mind, I feel that concussion being what it is, a mild traumatic brain injury and having certain things that happen afterwards that are treatable and the the pathophysiology itself of concussion being a short-term thing as far as we know – it's all the other components that go into it, such as the blood flow issues that are helped by exercise. Well, if you have a patient that, you know, smokes a pack a day is, you know, 70 pounds overweight and, you know, they have blood flow issues and now this has compounded that. And if the treatment is exercise, good luck getting them to do anything. And even when you explain it, oh, have you been exercising? No, no, I haven't. But yet they, they still just want you to help them, but you can't, like you have to help yourself. And so, that's one element. The other element is, is on the psychological side of things where, um, you know, patients have preexisting anxiety, depression and things like that, but they don't want to seek help for that or they, they're, they're still having that stigma. And so I feel that those patients are the ones that are going to have you know, the most difficulty in recovering. The patients who come in and say, you know what? Yeah, you're right. I'm going to do all this stuff and I'm really going to take it seriously. Um, I'm pretty confident that they will get better, mm-hmm. you know, the vast majority of the time. So, I guess yes and no is the <laughs> is the short answer to that question. Yeah. I'm guessing then so the no's, those those ones that are I guess I would consider them as, as non compliant or, or just uh they're not they're not giving themselves a the chance. What do you like is there a conversation you gotta have with them? Are they accepting of a conversation in inter- intervention basically, or is it just kinda it's there there's it's a mixed bag right i think that's a difficult conversation for people to have and i i'm very frank with my patients um and i think that's important uh but that being said you also have to do it in the right way you have to be able to tell a patient like look you know this is something that is an issue it's a known issue right this isn't just a you issue this is this happens is very common this happens to a lot of people and this these are the things that can hold you back and this is what I think we need to do to move forward. And I need you to be on board, right? If you're, if you're going to be here and we're going to go through this together, I will do everything I can to help you, but you got to put in the work and you got to be able to do this too. And so if I feel I'm not getting that buy-in after a few sessions, I have to be like, you know, kind of kickstart that back up and try to have that conversation again. And some people are a little more, you know, I, I guess, fragile or sensitive than others where it's a little bit more challenging to have that conversation and you know people have all sorts of life stress and things going on that you, you have no idea about right so trying to you know do it in a way that's kind of firm but gentle at the same time i think is is a nuanced thing that you know i still haven't figured out quite but uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm working on it well, i'm guessing that people do people come they pay you cash or is that insurance up there uh it's it's both so it depends on what they have so we go through um uh, third party payers for for physio and chiropractic care um, our health care system from like a physician standpoint is covered through the government um, so any th- anytime you're seeing a physician it's covered by ohip anytime you need an MRI it's covered by ohip which is which is our, our provincial insurance and but anytime you go to uh, therapy physio chiro massage um, it's either if you don't have insurance it's covered through cash or if you do have insurance it's usually through your work provider so you're, mm-hmm. you're your job will provide you with the insurance most of the time. You don't, you don't, is there, you don't see any relationship between uh, pay versus non pay compliance, or is it just a mixed bag in there? It's, it's really a mixed bag because if you're in a motor vehicle accident, for example, even if you don't have your own insurance uh, through your work, uh, your, your car insurance pays for all of your therapy that, that you need, right? So you'll have people that, um, you know, don't necessarily have work insurance, but they'll have motor vehicle accident insurance. Um, so, 
yeah, I find that it's, it's, it's really a mixed bag. Obviously people that are paying out of pocket, um, will come less frequently. They will, um, you'll have to just give them a lot of stuff they can try to do on their own. And they try to kind of self-manage, which sometimes isn't the best because just, I think the best thing about seeing somebody just a little bit more frequently, just at the start to try and get things kickstarted is just being there to answer their questions. Because Mm -hmm. when patients, patients will have like, you know, they might see their doctor, they won't see their doctor again for another six weeks. Well, during that six week period, you know, it might be the day or two after they saw that doctor and went, oh shit, I didn't ask him this. And, you know, am I allowed to exercise, for example, which they probably should have been doing, but now they didn't ask. So they're going to wait six weeks now to start something, mm-hmm. right? Whereas if, if they're seeing me, I'm going to see them, you know, probably once a week for the first couple of weeks to try and get them going on, on something, but they can continually ask me questions and I can continually reassure them, which I think is kind of the benefit of, of, um, of have more frequent follow-ups with patients. Mm-hmm. Why? Well, I, um, I know we're going to full, go for full circle back to exercise at some point here, so there's a good pr- point probably. But um, you said something on a different uh, interview that I heard there. It was you figure out the things exercise wise that they can actually do successfully, not trigger their symptoms. Um, I would I would assume and you correct me if I'm wrong, but your first couple times if you're implementing exercise, you you, you find some that are fail points, and then you find some that are successes, but it's a trial and error process. Is that is that right or? Yeah, I mean. With with just cardiovascular exercise, I think is one of the most important things is just get people moving. And so all, and it used to be that you would rest, 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 you know, after injury and, and, you know, don't do anything, just stay on bed rest. The same type of thing we used to do with patients with low back pain and neck pain, put them in neck collars and tell them not to move. And, you know, but that's just, we found out that's the worst thing you could do for somebody. And we're starting to realize that's the worst thing you do for somebody with a concussion as well is to put them in this cocoon dark room therapy, which ends up making them more sensitive to light and more, you know, uh, deconditioned than anything and more depressed and more anxious and everything else, which then compounds and makes things worse. And, um, so in the acute phases now we're learning that exercise is actually potentially beneficial or therapeutic, even as early as the first day. Now there's only been a, a couple studies on this. So we haven't gone to the point of full bore recommending patients start exercising that early, at least vigorously. So what we do in the first kind of 24 to 48 hours is we tell them to take it easy, but, they can go on their computer, they can go on their phone, they can do some homework if they feel fine, they can do anything from a cognitive standpoint that doesn't provoke their symptoms to a significant degree. If I mean, if you're sitting there with a headache, but you know, you want to watch TV, and the headache is staying the same throughout, well, are you really doing any harm? Well, probably not, right? But if your symptoms start getting provoked, well, maybe shut it down. But one thing we will always tell them is to is to not just lie on the couch and do nothing. We want them getting up, going for walks, you know, doing household chores, provided they're not too strenuous, you know, if they're a kid, you know, clean your room, do the dishes, uh, you know, you can vacuum the carpet. Like it's not a big deal. You can do a little bit of kind of physical activity to keep yourself moving and occupied. It's when people sit around and do nothing that they have the chance to focus on their symptoms and things like that. When you get a little bit further out, when you get into, you know, maybe a week or so after the injury, um, we're actually getting to the point now where our, we put people on the treadmill um, at the 10 day mark. And I think we're probably going to start doing that earlier and earlier, but we actually run them through a protocol and that's when you get into establishing what their threshold is. Mm-hmm. So we'll put them on a treadmill and we'll gradually ramp up their heart rate uh, through a walking test. Uh, it's kind of a standardized test. It's called the Buffalo concussion treadmill test. We'll put them on that, you know, within the first 10 days or so, if they're still symptomatic, if they're still symptomatic at 10 days, we say, okay, what can you do? Let's, let's see what your physical capacity is. And we start working them out and then they get symptomatic, let's say at a heart rate of 155 beats a minute or whatever. We say, okay, 155 is your threshold. So we don't want you working out at 155. We want you working out, you know, at less than that. And so generally the rule of thumb is, is 80% for non-athletes, 90% of their threshold for athletes. And you want them to work out um, at that 90% rate so that they're improving that blood flow. They're getting the blood flow going, but they're not creating, you know, symptoms for themselves. Mm -hmm. And the same, and the same thing goes for the vision and vestibular type stuff. It's like, okay, well, what can you do? Does this make you symptomatic? Okay, we'll do it, but do it, you know, at this level, not this level yet. And then we'll progress you as things, you know, improve in that way. But I think the big thing is, is people tend to baby concussion patients. Mm -hmm. We really tend to, you know, back off on everything and well, don't do that. If that makes you feel you know, symptomatic. And I think what we have to start doing is, is being a little bit more okay with, with symptoms. I think symptoms are, uh, you know, a a loose guide in terms of what you should and shouldn't do. But 
you shouldn't totally avoid it, uh, uh, completely avoid it because you end up kind of regressing in a way Mm -hmm. that I think is, is damaging. And I think that's, that was the issue with exercise is telling somebody to rest and sit in a dark room, don't do anything. Well, now you have somebody, let's say who are an athlete, they completely decondition themselves. And now any type of exercise, like walking up the stairs or going outside for a walk provokes symptoms because they're so out of shape. Mm -hmm by this point that even getting their heart rate up slightly makes them feel dizzy and nauseous. Well, you know, it's, it's like if you haven't worked out in a while and you go back to the gym and you know, you have a hard workout. Well, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's kind of I, thing. I think I, 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 I do think you're right with, uh, I know you have, we had back pain and neck pain, all that stuff where they, um, tend to rest them excessively. And I, I know there's a the time and place for it, but, um, I've noticed that people, tend to have a lot of sympathy or empathy for people in, in injuries and they just tell them to rest and relax, you know? And, uh, I don't know. I think it disables the people honestly. And, uh, but there's that acute phase, which is obviously I think we're needed, but then the rest is like, just get them moving, you know? Mm-hmm. But it's funny how it kind of, kind of full, comes full circle on that. Cause, uh, I never like, I know very minimal about concussions. I know, I know enough to know that there's a scat, and I know that I've done a scat a couple times, but I don't like managing. I, I wouldn't manage a concussion. Um, but it's funny that it kind of comes full circle. It's like, okay, well, you're not moving. Why don't we just move you? You know. So I don't know all their tolerances, tolerance though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was. I think that was. And I mean, kudos for the to the guys in Buffalo for kind of going down that road because without without them taking that chance and that idea like it was you couldn't even get a study like that pushed through like ethics committees because it was considered so common knowledge and best practice to just have people rest that even the idea of saying well why don't we try exercise was was like a difficult thing to get pushed through ethics and they started out with like really really chronic patients saying well like rest isn't working Let's, you know, get them exercising. And just with like an eight week exercise protocol, they had like almost a full resolution in symptoms in like 70% of their sample or something. (laughs) So then all of a sudden they go, whoa, okay. That was a fluke. Rest is better. Yeah. Like rest, (laughs) rest obviously isn't working, but there's something here. And then that led now to, let's say, okay, let's try these people at a month then two months, then all the way down. And now we're getting to the point where the study's coming out showing like exercise on the same day of injury, Mm -hmm. you know, the day after is potentially beneficial. So I think that, and this is only in the span of, you know, the past maybe, you know, seven, eight years that this has kind of gone this direction. And so I think we're, uh, uh, we're, we're onto something. I don't, I don't think Zurich didn't have it, right? Does Berlin have that in there? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, they do. So Zurich, Zurich was, um, you know, rest until asymptomatic completely and then gradually reintroduce activity berlin is rest for 24 to 48 hours and then reintroduce activity oh wow that's a big change that's a big <laughs> change that's a big change i could be honest with you, I, also, I didn't read berlin so <laughs> yeah so it, it was there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of really good changes in in berlin and that was one of them and um the other part on the exercise front was was displaying significant evidence for exercise for people with persistent concussion symptoms right Mm-hmm. And then that gets into what I'm talking about with those patients who are deconditioned and, and you know, they're a year or two out and they haven't done anything in two years because everyone they've gone to see has told them not to do anything. And that has completely disabled them to the point where they can't even leave the house half the time. Dude, well, is there, is there public common knowledge, whether, whether they have encountered a healthcare provider to tell them or not uh, about rest? Do they already, do they already consider rest as first option? Excessive yeah. rest? Yeah. And I have like all of patients come in and say, you know, we did everything right. You know, like this, these are more of the acute patients, right? Cause they have come to see me and maybe their injury happened a week ago and they've, you know, finally gotten in to see me or whatever, you know, a week later and they go, they're like, yeah, we did. We've done everything right. We've been resting perfectly the whole time. We haven't done anything. We haven't let them watch TV. We haven't let them go on his phone. We haven't, you know, we basically shut him down completely. And, was, and then you have to be like, well, <laughs> Yeah, okay, but here's what we're going to do now. And The, the kid's uh, depressed. He just can't play video games, probably. Oh, yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> that's another problem, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah? Let's let's go down that route. <laughs> well, no, I think just, I think in general, I think just the lack of, the lack of physical activity of our youth and everyone, you know. Oh, yeah. Are you a Dan John fan, by the way? Uh, who's that? Oh, I got to send you some Dan John stuff. So he's a, he's a very like simple, like strength coach. And 
um, I think it was him that said basically we our our kids aren't calloused enough. They need to start carrying shit and everything. And um, but he, he's very simple. I, I might be misquoting him, but for the most part, I believe so. Like I, whenever I have patients come in here and they're like they're overall kind of soft and like overall deconditioned, they have problems. And uh, I look at their hands and I'm like, you got you don't have any calluses. You're basically undateable as a human being. Like man or woman, no one should date you right now. You're soft. <laughs> So that's my thought on children. I uh, I tend to agree. <laughs> can I can I see your calluses? Let's let's compare calluses. <laughs> I gotta stop talking. Oh, I see them. Good. <laughs> hey, by the way, why are they in the last three fingers only? Unless you swing a bat. I don't know. I was thinking that the index is a dexterity digit. It has nothing to do with gripping. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. That's uh, I've never even thought about it. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, but well, obviously with swinging a bat, you'll get them. Uh, you'll get them on the the side of the index because it's a pivot point. But I don't know. My 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 ring finger seems to be the most prominent. Oh, of, is your is you have a ring on it? Well, I do, but I take it off when I lift. But yeah, I'm just looking at it right now. I see that it's most prominent on the. Hmm. I think I have ring ring, ring too. I would never file file these things down. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. What are you experimenting with uh, personally with concussions that that you you're excited about? Uh, I'm doing all sorts of um, stuff, really. Um, I think one of the things that I've been really interested in lately is uh, is just dizziness and vertigo. Um, I think that's a it's kind of a complex web, and um, so I've been playing with all sorts of all sorts of stuff clinically with that. And um, I mean, being a Cairo, I'm really interested in the the integration of the neck into the kind of vestibular picture. And I think people don't give it enough credit. Um, and I've been really finding a lot of patients and whether or not it's, you know, the fact that, you know, my bias is a Cairo that I, I keep finding this stuff or whether or not other people aren't looking hard enough for it or don't really know what to look for. I'm not sure, but um, finding patients with dizziness after concussions, I think it's, it's really interesting because they come in with, they don't, often come in with true vertigo where they don't really experience, you know, the room is spinning and things like that. And so, um, and I've even had patients where, you know, they've gone to vestibular rehab, quote unquote, and they've put them through, you know, various, um, you know, vestibular tasks and tests and things, and they haven't really been able to find anything or help them in any way. And, and um, the, the way that they describe their dizziness, and I find this with a ton of concussion patients is that they don't really feel you know, dizzy, they just feel off. And if you ask them to describe it, and I will always ask them to describe what they mean by dizziness, like does the room start spinning on you, you know, in that kind of vertigo feeling, or, but they'll describe it, it's kind of visual, they feel that the ground is a little bit shifted and moving a little bit. And they find mm. that when they're in a car, they, you know, they don't, you know, the motion of everything around them makes them feel off. And, or if they go to a shopping mall, or they're walking up and down a, an aisle at a grocery store, that's when they start to feel it. And, and so a lot of people would think, okay, well, that's visual, that's an overstimulation of the visual system. And, um, which, which it can be in, in some instances. And, and what I've been looking at then is, is, kind of running people through some tests for kind of the cervical spine, looking at, um, looking at just implications for different rotations of the head and having them walk and turn their head in different directions and ask, you know, when do they feel it? And once I figure, like, I have an idea behind this, actually, we did this with, um, with uh, this virtual reality headset, this thing called Saccad Analytics. I'll plug that a little bit. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a virtual reality headset. And so it looks at, it gets you doing all sorts of ocular things, but it also takes into account the position of your head because it's full 3D, uh, you know, virtual reality. And so you can look around with it and everything. And they get you to track, you know, dots and they get you to look at different patterns and it'll move the dot into certain things. Uh, it'll basically put you into like a Dick's Hall Pike position, you know, to try and stimulate vestibular um you know, nystagmus and whatever else. And it's filming your eyes the entire time and it's tracking your pupil response to it. How, how close are you to the dot? What, you know, what are your saccades like? You know, what's your nystagmus like in different positions and things like that. So these are all reflexes. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is like a very, very high tech tool designed to try and, you know, pick this stuff out. And we actually brought them in and I grabbed a bunch of my dizziness patients and they ran them through their kind of testing procedures, but I ran them through my clinical testing. And I said, you know, so I'd have them, and we filmed all this too. We have all this, <laughs> we have all this footage. So yeah, YouTube video like, to come? 
Yeah, we have. Well, I mean, we just we gotta put it all together because no one wants to watch an eight hour video of us like doing this, right? So we have to like splice and find the time to do it. But, That's a good CE course. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, we ha- yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we haven't we haven't done anything with it, but I would I would bring them out and I would test them through kind of some of my clinical tests, um, and then I'd kind of have I'd say, okay, I know what I want to do, and then they'd do this this machine. And they would have a printout of, okay, here's what's, here's what's happened. And then I would go in and based on what I found, I would just quick, quick, quick treatments, just doing little things, loosening off certain tissues, acupuncture needle here, a little bit of stimulation, maybe an adjustment or two here or there based on what I was picking up clinically and then bring them back out and run them through my tests again. And their dizziness is gone. And I'm talking in the span of like, you know, five minute quick little treatment, they mm-hmm. come out and they're at least significantly reduced, if not, if not gone. And then we put them on that system, which is again, think of that measuring reflexes mm-hmm. in the vestibular ocular system. And just by treating their neck, it's completely changed all these reflexes. Mm-hmm. And the, the person from Saccad Analytics was like, this is, this is insane that you're like, you're affecting neurology by doing this. And I know I listened to a little bit of the, the chiropractic neurology stuff, which I have absolutely zero training in, but I think that your vestibular system is your visual system, your, your kind of inner ear vestibular apparatus. And it's also the proprioceptive elements of your, of your joints and muscle tissue. And so people don't take that into account though. They'll sit there and work forever on the vestibular apparatus and the visual system. But if that, neck isn't working properly you're still going to get that mismatch signal and so the way i look at it is you know your eyes are saying here i am everything's level your ears are saying here i am everything's level and your neck is saying my head is like this because (laughs) and so then your brain goes like okay well who do i believe here right and it's that quick snap where you you know you're driving and you shoulder check and you go whoa that i feel weird with that and then it kind of calms down. And that's a lot what people will explain. And what I find that's just if you find out what's pulling where and how it's working and whatever, you can kind of get everything moving properly. That just kind of goes away because now the signals are all saying the same thing. Hmm. Uh, and I've been really, really playing around with that. So that's something that's really kind of exciting to me now. How do you design a study? How do you prove that out? You know, that's I think not for that's for smarter people than myself. But um there's been a few research articles that have shown that uh, treatment of the neck can resolve, you know, dizziness complaints in patients. So well, I would imagine the treatment of the neck too is not a, it's not standardized. It's based upon each person, right? Whatever you find. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> maybe one way to, I was just thinking when you're doing that quick turn thing, um, I've always thought that like, at least with, with movement for, for mechanical stuff, the slower you go, the more potential you have to be able to um, normalize a pattern. Let's just say, I'll keep it basic. Mm-hmm. Um, what if you just put like almost like their head on a shelf and just let them slide? Because I was thinking about if they turn and they might say something kind of catches a little bit on one side and creates a, an altered hinge point, maybe maybe mm-hmm. that affects the vestibular systems or the canals or the... Uh... Anyways, maybe standardize the turn is what I was thinking. Yeah, possibly. But I think that I don't even know if it's an actual like tilting or anything of the head. I think it's just the proprioceptive input that goes to you know to the brainstem and to the cerebellum it's mm, I receptor think it's, yeah so it may look it it may look absolutely normal and there may be no actual tilt in the way that they turn their head but people are going to compensate in certain ways and certain tissues are going to get stretched more than others and things like that so i don't know if it would be appreciable but hmm. uh it's an, it's an interesting concept you ever um so you're talking about um what kind of what kind of muscles are you usually working on back there, or what things are you working on back there? Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. I mean, so for what I, the, just the way I think about it, and other people can try and play around with this too. If you have any dizziness patients, you want to <laughs> put some finger. One of one of the tests that I do is uh, is yeah, exactly yeah. Uh, I'll I'll have people just it's just a base. Here's one of the tests I'll do. So I'll have a patient walk, you know, take two or three steps going forward turn their head as far as they can to the right while still walking so you're and then you keep walking take two or three steps with your head turned all the way to the right and then you come back to the middle and you keep walking and then you turn your head all the way to the right again and you keep walking for two or three steps and then you kind of stop so you're doing basically two or three steps neutral two or three steps with your head turned to the right two or three steps neutral two or three steps with your head turned to the right and you stop and then i'll ask them how do you feel with that did that provoke anything do you feel a little bit off with that or do you feel okay if they say, well, no, that feels fine, I'll just ignore that altogether and I'll have them come back the other way but turning their head to the left this time. Two or three steps straight on, two or three steps with your head turned to the left, two or three steps straight on, two or three steps with your head turned to the left. And then, you know, oh, yeah, that makes me feel a little bit weird. 
So in my mind, and just what I've been playing with, is whatever tissues are being stretched at that time, Mm -hmm. whatever tissues are being elongated or stretched at that time, those are the ones I'm going to focus on the most. Because just the way I think about it is if you have a muscle that has some sort of trigger point or tension point in it, Mm -hmm. and you're going to turn, you're going to turn your head to the left, let's say, and I find that the SCM muscle, um, sternocleidal mastoid, as well as kind of the deep neck flexors, things that are, you know, closer to the joint as well, that, that they're more proprioceptive in general, right? Um, so as you turn to the left, your left SCM kind of pulls around your neck. That's kind of getting stretched, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, your, your splenius capitis on the right is getting stretched. The inferior oblique muscle on the right is getting stretched. The superior oblique muscle on the left is getting stretched. Um, and so I'll focus then on let's say those like four main muscles where I'll do a little bit of suboccipital work on that side. I might put an acupuncture needle in the left SCM, stim it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I might get them to do a little bit of deep neck flexor as well, you know, just kind of active release therapy type stuff. Uh, And then if there's any restricted joints, I'll, you know, potentially manipulate those joints. And, and then they have this full free range motion. Now when they turn to the left, they don't, nothing's pulling, you know, they can get way more range of motion. And then I think just the signals that go up now through the brainstem is that Hmm. everything is smooth and good. And there's none of those kind of pulling points and they don't feel dizzy anymore. And this is something that can literally take like five or 10 minutes to to do. You just kind of have them walk, figure out what it is. The other one is looking straight up in the air. So they tilt their head way back, look way up in the air. If that one is positive, then I'm going like both SCMs potentially. And then deep neck flexors is where I'm going to focus on a lot. Um, And I find a lot of people are just dysfunctional in this like deep neck flexor kind of spot. And so I'll get them doing things, you know, like isometric chin tucks, I'll get them doing uh, cervical joint reposition, you know, error stuff and some of the rehab stuff that goes along with some of that manual treatment. But I mean, this stuff will come back, right? I'm not saying this is a one shot. It's, you know, these patterns have probably been developed for years and an injury has probably provoked them or put them over the edge where they're, where they're, you know, causing trouble. And um, I might have to treat it two or three times, but at the same time you have to then, you know, have the right rehab strategy in place. So they're strengthening and kind of getting better at that from a, movement perspective as well nice yeah actually you you covered what i was going to ask because i'm guessing some of the r2p or dns people would say well why don't we work on the the phasic as well but it sounds mm-hmm. like you're doing you're doing both you're just uh, uh releasing the tonic and working the phasic and then the test normalizes mm-hmm. for a period of yeah, time I th- yeah i mean i feel that there's um and this is just from kind of the instagram kind of rehab world i feel there's this huge push now against against the manual side of things. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I feel this kind of phase shift where everyone's, everyone's really focusing on, um, you know, more of the rehab and the exercise model than, than the passive and manual. And I think that, I think there's a place, right. I think there's a place for both. And so my, I can get something done. I think a hell of a lot quicker by, you know, doing the manual stuff and then get them, get them feeling good. And then now rehab and strengthen that, mm-hmm. right. Rather than, if I just went straight into exercise and they have this dysfunctional pattern, right. That's very subtle. Like I don't think you're going to be able to pick it up as, as, as a clinician, unless you get your hands right on it, but then I'm just going to reinforce and strengthen this kind of, you know, dysfunctional pattern. Yeah. Uh, at, least, at least in my mind. So I, I get things moving well and then tr- kind of train them into that and, and then keep, you know, keep making my little uh, adjustments while keep reinforcing that from a strengthening and rehab's perspective. So, yeah, I completely agree. I, I, I would practice exactly the same if I mess with concussions, but I I do them on the other parts. Um, interesting though, I didn't think we'd end up going down this today. <laughs> I didn't think we'd end up in the, down the ma- manual therapy corrective exercise route. Never know where you're going to go. <laughs> no, um, but I do want to learn about fur trapping. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know I was going to. I usually sneak it in, like whatever whatever you said earlier. I'll sneak it in through part of the story, but we're getting close to the end here. And damn it, I want to hear about fur trapping. <laughs> uh yeah so we were talking just beforehand and uh, i'll just kind of preface this uh but he asked me if i had any good stories and i said my background was kind of interesting and i know nothing about fur trapping i will tell you that but uh my my father uh, was a, was a fur trapper i grew up uh for those that know canadian geography i grew up about four hours north of thunder bay um in the canadian shield in the bush um my when I was born, my parents lived in a one room cabin um, with no running water, no road, uh, no power. Um, I don't know if they had a telephone out there. I would doubt it, though. But um, everything was run off a diesel generator to get water. We had to go cut holes in the ice with uh, 
with an auger and kind of carry it up and boil it on the stove. And damn, um, but yeah, my dad, my dad was a fur trapper. He had a trap line. He trapped all sorts of animals. He was also a taxidermist, so he would be constantly, you know, making rugs and stuff. If uh, like some tourists came up and let's say they shot a bear or something, might you know give it to him, make a rug or some sort of you know mount or something for hey, it. And, has he ever made a jackalope, by the way? A what? A jackalope. I don't even know what that is. Oh my god! Okay, I'm gonna do a screen share while you keep talking. <laughs> I, I, I need to find you, Jack Lope. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is just this is just my upbringing. So yeah, just grew up in the bush, hunting, fishing, and um, you know, kind of living that life is is good. Now I live in a huge city, and I just miss that part of uh, I guess life and growing up. Did you? Um... Do you con- do you consistently go back to to kind of do that stuff? Oh, can I you, used to. Can you see my screen? Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's a mythical mythical jackalope. <laughs> it's a. It looks like a <laughs> rabbit and a deer. Yeah, the the antelope. I think this took, put the horns on a, a jackrabbit, or did they? Is it real? We don't know. Uh, uh. Only tax- taxidermists can really tell us the truth. So you better ask your dad. I'll ask him. Yeah. Um, I used to go back quite a bit, I guess. Um, my parents moved from there uh, when I was going to university. So they moved a little bit further south. So, um, But I used to fight forest fires um, up there So it, when I was in university. So it's a, it's a, a summer job. And um, I would go up uh, to where I'm from, which is Sioux Lookout, Ontario. And uh, there's another town about – two or three hours north of Sioux Lookout called Pickle Lake. And uh, I used to fight forest forest fires up in Pickle Lake. And uh, so I spent my summers kind of riding around in helicopters and, um, you know, cutting down trees and putting fires out in the middle of the bush. And um, so that would, that would bring me back in, in, in the summers because Sioux Lookout was kind of the nearest town. So we'd drive there and stuff and visit all my friends and stuff. But now my parents are gone from there. So I haven't been back in, I don't know, years i don't know maybe like seven years or so but uh I, we were planning on going up this summer but uh, uh we ended up having a baby so that oh, kind of congrats thwarted, thwarted that plan but uh maybe maybe sometime in the next few years i want to get up there you know there's a possibility that <clears throat> it sounds so desolate out there that maybe concussion patients can, can can unplug at a nice clinic up there maybe a tent camp i would love that <laughs> it's just like a fly-in fly-in concussion program where yeah. you know come up and go fishing and you know just oh, chill for a while. It'd be great. There'd be so much Perfect. stimulus, but productive stimulus. Just fresh air, you know. Yeah. Breeze. You ever, you ever look out? Outside. You ever look outside? Like I do this because I'm so I'm an Eagle Scout. I used to we used to go backpack a lot, but then I live in the city now too. But I look outside and I think, damn! Like I, I I wish I was by a lake right now, or like I wish I could smell the alpine. This is this is my ask my wife. This is <laughs> I keep telling her I'm like we just, I I got we got to move up north like that's what I want. That's uh you know that's my my dream is to you know have a cottage somewhere just a small little cabin somewhere and yeah. just get away just you know but just a way to get away from everything and that's how I grew up. Like I grew up on the lake like where our house was was right on the right on the water. Um you know we had our we had our own float plane till I was about probably 10 years old or so that we could just go fly wherever. And, uh, I had my own boat probably around when I was 10 years old and all my friends lived on the lake and just, you just so free, just drive to their house and spend the day fishing or, you know, go wakeboarding or tubing or whatever. And these, these were our summers. This is like, this is how we lived. It was just the best. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it just, it's, it's, it's a just, shame that I can't do that anymore. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure you can, you can, you can pull a, you can pull a McGill and just go live out in the bush and people fly out to see you. Yeah, that, just, that's that's what I'm talking about. Just, just make a barn out there and a bunch of tree houses turn butter. <laughs> <laughs> Live uh, off the land. Yeah, that would be great. I, 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 I never actually killed animals to eat them. That would be the thing I would struggle with other than fishing. Um, but I would have I would have no problem just, just walking out in the woods for a little bit. That would be great. So, never been to Canada, though. I heard it's nice. Oh, you should come. I would like to. It's a great place. Just don't come in the winter. I hear, so, I've heard that too. <laughs> it's a little cold. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there now. I mean, all the leaves are coming off the trees, and it's been raining for about a week and a half. But uh, at least we don't have some of the snow that some of the other parts of Canada have already. Yeah. What What month should I be coming to Canada then? Like July? 
yeah, come in, come in July and August. That's uh, that's a nice time. Come for Canada Day. There's Canada Day. Yeah, it's like your July Fourth. Ours is July First. Oh, Day. yeah. Wait, what is it? What is yours? July third. July first. July first. Yeah. What is the? Did Canada get its independence? This is going to seem very. It's probably a really bad question. I don't know Canada, can, Canada <laughs> okay. history. <laughs> well, we're still we're still you know part of the British Commonwealth in terms of uh, like our you know our stuff still comes from the Crown um, in terms of like any of our our laws and stuff needs kind of royal assent and um, that type of stuff. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's. I mean, we are independent, like we're we're our own nation, but um, I think I think Canada Day is is just like the birth of Canada as a country. Mm-hmm. I think even even if you're not independent technically, then I bet if they wanted to confine you, they couldn't. You just go hide out there. <laughs> There's a lot of space. There's a lot of space. Yeah. Um, as we recap here, uh, I, I I feel the need to ask you then, <clears throat> since I, I struggle with this over here, when I get a concussion, seemingly like concussion, seemingly seemingly like, I'm going to say I got a concussion patient. Where the hell do I send them? Because I don't want to manage them, nor can I. How do you find somebody? Because I think that's a little challenging. Well, I mean, I, I think I think you're right. I think it is a little challenging. That's what we're trying to do um, with with Complete Concussion Management, which is a, an organization that, that um, I founded about five years ago. And um, the idea was to to educate people. I think because you know, as I mentioned before, you know, in, according to the Berlin Consensus Statement. You know, there's more and more evidence coming out showing that the best treatments for concussion are more kind of therapy based, right? So it's it's exercise, it's getting people on treadmills, it's things uh, like vestibular rehab and visual rehab and and treatment of the neck, whether it be manual or or rehab focused. Um, and so, I think there's a lot of elements to concussion that you really need kind of a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and oftentimes, you can't necessarily find that in one clinic location. I mean, there's there's psychological components that go into this. There's you know there's all sorts of mental health and chronic pain overlap sometimes. And sometimes there's neurological focus where you need a neurologist to to look at things. And so I think it's a it's a very multi uh, faceted kind of thing. And so what our goal is is to set up. Uh, a network of clinics where we can train healthcare professionals because it's not something that's part of standard training, right? It's not something you typically get in a physiotherapy program or chiropractic program. And so you have to kind of go out and learn that stuff on your own. And people are picking up pieces of it here and there, right? Like we often, you know, talk with clinics in the States and say, you know, I treat concussions. I'm a vestibular therapist or, you know, that type of thing. So that's great. That's one component, but there's, you know, about five or six more components you should be adding to that list if you really want to get into the concussion field. And so what we've been, what we've been trying to do is form a network of clinics where if people type in concussion, they can find, you know, complete concussion management certified clinics. And these clinics have been, trained and educated by us uh and our training course is probably 35 hours long and we update them on a, on a monthly basis as to kind of the new evidence so these clinics are are getting everything not just the vestibular side of things but they're learning everything we know about concussion and the idea is to have these you know what we call primary access clinics where you can go in and see somebody like a therapist they can get you on the right path they can go all right let's let's run a treadmill test let's see where you're at with that let's check your visual and vestibular systems let's get you started on some rehab for that let's start seeing if there's anything going on with your neck let's provide you with the education and hopefully kind of lower some of that anxiety you might be having let's fix your diet let's see what you're eating and why could that potentially you know impact things with concussion and then from there it's okay this person needs a little bit more advanced stuff or this person actually does need a neurologist or this person actually does need a psychotherapist or whatever it may be that's beyond, you know, the purview of the average, you know, physical therapist or chiropractor or AT uh, or even, you know, local family physician or GP, then trying to find those professionals within the community to then be able to refer, you know, to and kind of work together on a co-management type of thing. So in Canada, for example, we've set up all of these complete concussion management clinics, and we have probably close to 200 or so in Canada. Oh, I think wow. in the U.S. now, I, th- I think in the U.S. we have about 30 locations that are now up and running, uh, and we're and we're probably in talks with another 50 more or so at this point. Uh, and so we're just growing the network in the U.S. This is the first year we've been in the United States, and so um, that's that's why there's not as many. But and then in Canada, once we had that network in place of those 200 clinics, 
we then brought in a network of like occupational therapists that do a mm-hmm. lot of cognitive testing, cognitive based rehabilitation. Uh, we're currently trying to bring in a group of vision therapists that are optometrists that specialize in neurovision rehabilitation. Uh, and then a, a, a whole network of naturopathic doctors that have advanced training in like treatment of dietary issues, you know, associated with concussion and traumatic brain injury. Now you have these people that are all linked together in these networks where you know that you're referring to somebody who's who's got kind of advanced skills in this area and everyone's going to be providing you know, consistent messaging. And so that's our goal is to set up these collaborative multidisciplinary care networks uh, all over the place. And so, um, like I said, we're up to about 260 clinics now uh, worldwide, but most are in Canada because that's where we started. But uh, we're, you know, slowly but surely picking up some momentum in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, and as well as Australia and the U.K., yeah, nice. I think, um, yeah, it would be nice. To, is there one down in L.A. area by chance? Uh, if you go to completeconcussions.com, there's a button there that says find a clinic. And uh, I think we have some. Um, I know we have one up by San Francisco. And uh, I think we might have a couple in in the L.A. area. Okay. Uh, if I log on there, is the password Pickle Lake? <laughs> it's it, it's not but it definitely should be yeah, it's a combination of the word pickle up, your favorite up, dog's name look, and your birthday <laughs> yeah yeah look up if you have if anyone who's listening just look just google pickle lake oh, oh i thought you were gonna tell me to google complete concussion <laughs> uh no, pickle lake is an interesting it's an interesting place it's, what does it uh, what does it taste like pickle juice Oh man, it tastes. This is fresh water. It's beautiful. Oh, Pickle Lake. Yeah. So we do have one. We have one in Simi Valley, um, which would be the closest one to, to L.A., just north. Oh, cool. Oh, oh I, I thought we were on Pickle Lake again. Uh, well, I'm, I, I was looking at the map of. <laughs> hey, they got pike there. Oh yes, they do. You catch pike, walleye. Yep. Sturgeon. Yep. Oh gosh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> Yeah, you should make HQ up there for sure. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to go that far, but uh, but we'll give you so, a reason to to fly your float plane three at a time. Yeah. yeah. All right on. Well, where can everyone reach you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at uh, concussion underscore doc. You can also uh, send me an email if you want. Uh, C Marshall at completeconcussions dot com. Uh, you can find us on the web completeconcussions dot com. And uh, also our Instagram uh, page for Complete Concussions is at Complete Concussions. Cool. Anything else you want to add before we close out? What, um, what's, what's it going to say on your gravestone? On my gravestone? <laughs> um, ah, man, you're hitting me with the hard ones here. <laughs> I got to be so reflective. <laughs> I, I, I'd be so reflective. I'm just not that, uh, not that witty, I guess. Yeah, I think mine would be uh, under promise, over deliver consistently. I think I think that's that's more of a mantra that I need to be you know more catering to in my in my current life rather than uh, yeah I think that's 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 a good one though. Oh, right on. Um, thanks so much for being on. It was great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Right on. Thanks so much, Doctor Marshall, for being on. I uh, God, there's got to be a forgetting Sarah Marshall joke in here somewhere, somewhere. But I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, Dr. Marshall, if you uh, remember one, if you think of one, then just email me because I'm, I'm dry. I'm dry on this one. If you guys are looking for the show notes on this, this is 117. Just go to p2sportscare.com and go to the search function. Put 117, nothing more, nothing less. No pounds, no hashtags, nothing fancy. You don't even have to put his name in. Just put 117. But if you do search, search his name as 2 L's and Marshall. Go on there and you'll find all the show notes and transcription to the show here and any links that we spoke about. So... If you guys got information from this one, there's actually quite a few more interesting podcasts that you might want to hear. The ones that at least stick out to me that I had a good time doing and I learned a lot from is that number one, number one probably is, uh, so actually, sorry, episode 91 is pretty amazing. That's Michael Shacklock talking about clinical neurodynamics. Uh, 67 is Dr. Stu McGill. He's talking about back-related conditions, especially flexion intolerant back pain. 63 was Stu McGill, as well as Brian Carroll, which was amazing in regards to talking about Brian's story, how he overcame uh, a pretty horrific injury of the low back and went on to start lifting a ton of weight again. So that's a really cool one as well. 105 is one of my personal favorites, and I'll leave it right there. Me and Dr. Cody Demack go over some syndromes of the lower extremity and how we can possibly influence them using corrective exercise. So... 
Those are ones that I would suggest that you go at least start playing with if you are new to the show and you're looking for something to really wow you and change your life. Again, if you guys have listened to this show a bit and you like it so far, I'm going to ask you to do one thing right now, and I will not stop talking until you actually do it, is I want you to go on, scroll down, and review it for me. Because information, if you like if you like the information that I'm putting out, it really only goes as far as you promote it, okay? You are, you are my little army of promoters. If you like it, share it. Send it to a friend who is in need of this information, whether doctor or patient. And if you like it, review it. Reviews are really important for podcasts. So if you can do that, I would love to get before the end of the year, before the end of the year, before December 31st, can you give me a birthday or a Christmas present? A Christmas present and get me up to 50 reviews, please. I think we're at like eight right now. Come on. Come on. This is 115, 17 podcasts we've already done. Can you please do one? One. We have over a thousand people downloading per podcast. Please review. I mean that in the nicest way. Uh, help a brother out. Uh, lastly, if you guys have someone that you want me to interview, just just uh, hit me up on Instagram again. That is uh, at performancehb. Uh, or just email me. That's seb, S-E-B, at p2sportscare.com. Remember, if you are dating, date, date, date an Eagle Scout who doesn't stutter and then leave people better than how you found them. Gravestone. See you later.